as a woman, <laughs> we have a lot of external noise about how we should look and what we should buy and how all the things that um, can really drive us insane. Welcome to another episode of the Love to Move podcast, where we take a look at all the definitions of the word move and tell you why we love them. If you were to ask me what is one of the best ways to move through life, what is one of the best ways to move in general, be it physical movement or even just the way that we travel and grow, I would say mindfully. I would say mindfully and present in the moment. And that is exactly what we're going to be talking about today is that movement through life while being present in the moment and not your usual stuff of where, well, sit down and meditate for a little bit. I don't find that to be helpful. I brought up to our guest a lot of the issues that I might have with, oh, well, this is what everybody always says. How can we make this more adaptable? How can we actually make this useful in our everyday lives? As opposed to hearing the same cliche again and again. My guest today is Leah Diamond, and we're gonna be talking all things mindfulness and how to help you be present as you move through life. So please join me in welcoming Leah Diamond. All right, wait, what do you want help with here? What's going I on? I just want to get grad. I'm just, I am so, I got so much energy. I'm bouncing around all the time. And I know that on this episode, we're trying to be a little more present in the moment. <laughs> and I'm monkey minding my way around right now. So I need your help to just to br bring me down a little bit from, from the high energy. Yeah, yeah, let's make it a yes and. And so just kind of for the first thing is just like plant your feet on the floor. I know you're standing. So I want you to just like bring your awareness down, down, down to your feet mm -hmm. and just feeling them on the floor. Yeah, it's great that you closed your eyes. And so you're just bringing a, a curious attention to the sensations of your feet and whether you have socks or shoes on, doesn't matter, you're just feeling into the four corners of the feet planted on the ground, noticing we have gravity always there for us unconditionally without exception. And so now just taking a few full conscious deep breaths. I'm going to guide you first before you go into it. Of course, keep breathing. <clears throat> You're going to fill your belly and your lungs all the way up to the top. And at the top, take another sip of air. Let it all out with a nice vocal exhale. Yeah, just letting it all empty out until your body says, oh, it's time to take another breath here. It's just consciously filling the lungs, filling the belly all the way to the top, holding it for a brief moment, take another sip of air, let it all out with a nice vocal exhale, just feeling all of that energy dropping down into the body. And then when your body tells you, go ahead and filling, filling, filling from the belly and lungs, diaphragm all the way up. Take another sip. Let it all go with a nice vocal exhale. And when that breath completes, just allow the natural rhythm of the breath to restore. <sighs> And just noticing any sensations you have in the body at this time. What are you present to? You? And just, again, directing your attention towards what's happening on the inside. It could be the rise and the fall of the chest or belly. Perhaps it's any physical sensations from that breath or even just standing or sitting in this moment. Just kind of noticing what's here. being curious about what your present experience is in this body at this moment.
And then we're just gonna again, draw the awareness and attention from your head and your mind and your thinking down, down, down the body, down the torso, through the pelvis, down the legs and to the feet. Feeling that gravity supporting you, always there. Just tuning in to that gentle, unconditional holding your feet planted on the ground. And then just taking another conscious deep breath, however feels right for you in this moment. And when you feel ready, gently open your eyes. That really helped. I, I love that this is how we're starting the episode because this is the first time we've ever started an episode like this. And I love firsts uh, on this podcast. Uh, we had one episode where I noticed that my guest in all of her pictures loved sitting with her knees up to her chest. Just, I, it was everywhere. Um, and I, I pointed that out to her and she said, you know, I really don't like sitting in chairs. I love sitting on the ground. So we filmed the episode sitting on the ground. Uh, so good. <laughs> I love finding those various different different ways and interesting um, we had an, a previous episode where we had some breath work done and I was when I was doing one of the breath work exercises I had this experience of I all of a sudden felt that I was in a giant room almost like a giant hall I had the same experience again now when you were going through the breaths I took three deep breaths throughout that whole thing and by the end of it I was feeling like whoa again I'm in a giant space um, my room isn't tiny, but it by no means is it, you know, like a concert hall. Um, so very interesting. I'm, I should really spend some time exploring that feeling uh, in here, whatever, whatever that may be. But today is about you. It's not about me, me exploring my, my breath work. Um, <laughs> welcome. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, we're going to be talking about being present, um, which is why I I asked you to ground me a little bit and help me help me be a little bit more present now and not um, jumping around as much so that people can get to know you a little bit better. Can you tell us a little a bit, a short version of your story of how you got into feeling maybe into meditation, if that's the way you wish to label it? I know that you've been meditating for a long time, um, but also just this work of, of being present and helping other people be more present in the moment. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate you letting me ground you. <laughs> I was really enjoying your big energy. And I also heard you, you were like, ah, so thank you for that opportunity. I'm, I'm so honored. And um, yeah, I appreciate opportunities to help people just get back in their body so much. Um, and that expanded awareness is just like yummy. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know how some speakers or people who lead can struggle with self-doubt and feel possibly paralyzed with a fear of being seen or public speaking? Mm -hmm. So with over 40 years of experience as an actor, after getting hundreds of gigs, directing, and a background in managing corporate communications for a Fortune 500 company, I still get nervous. Every time I speak in front of groups. So I've developed a system that I teach my entrepreneurial speakers to help them not only rock their speaking gigs, but get paid more while they do it and feel more calm and relaxed. Mm -hmm. So because if you really knew me, you'd know, even though I have over 40 years of experience, I've had stage fright most of my life. So thankfully, I have accumulated all of these different tools and practices, and I have what I now call the Mary Poppins bag of tools to work with, because my anxiety can be so sneaky sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been fascinated with meditation and spirituality and philosophy. It's just been, you know, something I've been curious about, and as a mindfulness meditation teacher, it is like just really a true honor to guide and support people because I know how it feels. I'm human too. So I, I use these tools and practices every day uh, so that I can show up 
in all the different ways that I do show up. Uh, I need a lot of energy and capacity. Uh, I'm a single mom to a, a daughter and a fur baby, so <laughs> they require a lot. Um, yeah, and then my, my clients and all the different ways they show up in service. So uh, does that answer some of your question? <laughs> sure, I think we're, we're, we're getting to know a little, bit, a little bit more about you, absolutely. Um, yeah. We have a lot of places that we can go from here, but mm -hmm. I, think, I think we're gonna dive into this idea of why we might need to be present and only because you brought up your daughter. I also uh, am gonna wanna come back and talk about things you've learned about being present from your daughter, because I think sometimes mm -hmm. kids can hit us with those truth bombs where yep. we go, that's so simple. Why, why have I as an adult <laughs> convoluted my experience on this planet so much that it's just, it's just so simple. But first tell us why it's important to sort of be in this present moment as compared to jumping around, thinking about the future, thinking about the past and ping-ponging back and forth. Yeah, yeah, what a great question. It's, there's a lot of different parts to this question. And, you know, being human, the way our minds work, they generally do bounce around from, you know, rehashing the past to projecting into the future and fantasizing. It's just how our minds work. So thankfully, there are all these different techniques all these different types of meditation, ways of focusing, working with your cognition so that you can't, you're going to see my puppy from time to time. It's going to happen. She's super curious. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure people love it. This podcast loves dogs. Yeah. So it's great. Talk about keeping you present all day. So, uh, working with ourselves with different tools and practices, it supports us in being more awake and aware and as it's like a muscle totally like I love that you're all about movement and you know that when we don't move as much it's like that energy starts to become a little more stagnant it makes it more challenging we might have more aches and pains right mm -hmm. so I like to think of meditation as like mental hygiene <laughs> because you can't meditate one day a month and expect to like be able to clear your mind, be more focused, be more aware and present, right? Mm -hmm. If you're practicing a little bit here and there throughout the day, which is why I bring mindfulness and meditation together, you know, when you're doing something, a good portion of the day, like they've, they've done some studies and it's like something like 40 or 50% of the day, you're, you're just kind of on autopilot. We have a great nervous system that supports us in doing things, this conditioned mind, the habitual behaviors, that kind of stuff. You just go in autopilot. You know, you can space out where you're driving a car, which is so dangerous, right? Because people are on their phones and even though there's like a huge fine you can get, you're, People are finding ways to be distracted because it's just how our minds are, right? It's really human of us. So uh, without making us, ourselves bad or judging ourselves, we can just turn towards, okay, well, what can I do? And that is practicing, you know, with meditation or even exercise or bringing mindfulness into your life so that when you tell your child, hey, you've been on technology for too long, and they're like, I see you on your phone. <laughs> You're call talking about getting checked out, uh, called out by your kids, right? I, I get that. I get that. Um, I know I've read studies about having kids on. I'm sorry, my puppy's distracting me because she's biting the electrical cord. Hey, love, come here. Um, and so I read these studies about what it does to the brain when we or even our kids are on electronic devices, you know, and then here I am on my phone responding to an email or a text. And so I'm doing the very thing that I'm asking her not to do. So it like just kind of comes back to integrity. So it's like finding ways like, okay, well, can I set some structure and boundaries around how much time I'm spending on it so that I'm in integrity? you know, cause we're modeling all the time with our kids <laughs> and it's like, you can't say do as I say, not as I do. Right. I think that's an older thought of, you know, like my parents. So instead, like, how can I be present to 
what I'm requesting of her as well as knowing like what this does to my brain and be, be present with her because she's growing so fast. Right. Mm -hmm. That was kind of all over the place. No, I think we hit some, some great points. Okay. It came up for me, and this is, um, this is a philosophy that I've recently gotten really, really more capable of actually adopting than just thinking about. And this is one that I sort of came up with myself from a humor perspective when I was a kid, and then it's kind of lived with me, and now I'm thinking, no, you really need to be viewing it this way to a degree. And it's this idea of good and bad. So mm -hmm. I, I like to say that if you tell yourself you're going to have a good day, you're basically saying at some point you're going to have a bad day uh, because you're making that distinction of this is good and this is bad. Mm -hmm. Not that we shouldn't ever make that distinction, but you're opening yourself up to that and just be aware of it as opposed to having this is a day. This is the experience. This is the way that it kind of kind of goes through. And I think so many of us immediately go, nope, this is bad. This is good. And most of that doesn't have to do what's happening in the moment. But what happened before or what we think is going to happen because we're nervous and anxious about the thing that's going to happen uh, in the future and if we're truly present in the moment we realize today's the day it's just a day um, yeah. or as uh Pooh likes to say what day is it today ah my favorite uh, oh i love that <laughs> so that kind of presence how do you feel about that that idea uh you can totally trash it i don't i don't mind um but, yeah. but this idea of the distinction of good and bad and how we start to label our day and yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And it's true. We have what's called this negativity bias, mm -hmm. right? Our brains are searching for ways of like keeping us safe. And so that labeling of like, oh, this is bad. It's just <clears throat> a strategy, right? And so um, what I, I, what I've done for myself, uh, I, I just wake up and set intentions. Like, how do I want to show up today? Because the day will be however it is. It's totally out of our control. It's completely uncertain. So what I do have control over is declaring my intentions for how I'd like to show up. And if I can anchor that in and remember and come back to it when the surf gets a little unsteady and you know, chaotic, I could be like, oh, okay, I have something to fall back on. Like, how do I want to show up? And maybe it's in my grace and ease and curiosity. So that when those parts of me that want to just survive the day, or I hate what's happening right now, this sucks, you know, I, I don't like collapse into being sucked into those feelings of bad day right mm -hmm. instead I can notice oh wow I don't really like what's happening right now and how I'm noticing how that feels in my body like maybe my chest is getting a little contracted mm -hmm. and my breathing is getting a little bit shorter and now my throat feels a little constricted and I can notice what's actually physically happening in my body I'm like oh wow this is my reaction to where my thoughts are going about how I don't like what's happening. And then, okay, well, what can I control? My breathing right now. And we can take a big deep breath. <laughs> Get back to this present moment, like right here. I'm like not letting myself breathe very well. <laughs> okay, let's just take care of myself, right? What do I need right now? So just coming back to my needs in that moment and then thinking, oh yeah, well, I said I wanted to show up this certain way today. It's not always easy. I am so not perfect at this. However, it becomes a habit. And just like building that self-awareness muscle, you know, when I start to notice like how I could easily just get sucked in or triggered or get charged about something that like, my puppy keeps distracting me right now but she's so cute and furry, you know? And then I can come back because I've been grounding into these intentions. What, how does that land on you? It's no, it's good. I, I want to ask you a question that I hope it doesn't put you way too on the spot if you can remember it, but I'm curious what intentions you've had and you set for today uh, when you woke up today. And obviously this was scheduled. We knew we were recording it. I'm not going to take it personally if none of your intentions had anything to do with me. That's not why I'm asking. I'm just interested. Could we have an example of what were the intentions you set, for example, for today? 
Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. So I actually have a journal that I write things down in. And so that way, like, I have a gratitude practice, I have intentions of like, you know, sometimes people set goals and things for themselves, you know, so for me, like, I think about the intentions of how I always want to show up. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'll just share a few of them. Mm -hmm. And so that what helps me kind of navigate my life is to start my day and think about how I want to show up is I want to show up open, curious, in my heart. Harmonious conflict resolution skills are on point (laughs) in my integrity and gratitude. And is that similar day in, day out, I'm guessing? Yeah. And that's important. I think that listeners need to understand that that is is all the same thing again. Yes, because it's that consistent reminder of starting your day with that thing over and over and over. For those that may not see the distinction, could you talk a little about the distinction? Because you sort of made it between intentions and goals because they are different. Yeah. Um, Could you talk about that difference? Yeah, yeah. And I'd just like to say one thing before I go into that um, distinction is that you can set intentions throughout your day. Like before meeting you, like my intentions of how I want to show up is like just connected and curious about like, hey, you invited me to speak on your podcast. Why? You know, like there's so there's ways in which I, I plan to set intentions. Like if I go on a date or have a phone call or a sticky conversation, whatever it might be, like I'm getting present with myself before I do these things. Now, when we set goals, they could be short-term goals, long-term goals, but it's like there's an action required and a follow through and an expected result. Mm -hmm. You know, like we can keep it as simple as like, all right, laundry's piling up. I have a goal of getting all that laundry done today. (laughs) So I know that I want to time it during a time when the energy, you know, like at certain times of the day, the energy they say between like, I think it's four and nine, you don't want those peak times. So you don't want to do it during that time. Like, so there's ways of looking at that goal. Like, how can I support myself in creating that outcome while it also all the other moving pieces in life? You know, I think your listeners probably know how to set goals, but that's the distinction of like, there's some action and follow through and and an expected result when you set goals, Mm -hmm. not always the expected result, but there's a result with intentions. You're really stepping into and embodying a way of being that is mindful and conscious. Yeah. Does that, how does that it land on you? segues perfectly, actually, <laughs> into this next part uh, about meditation. Um, meditation gets a bit of a bad rep. Uh, you have people who go, oh, meditation is pointless. You just sit and think about nothing for hmm. five minutes. Uh, what is that? You have other people that go on 10-day silent retreats. Um, they'll do that. Uh, that's, uh, that was my experience as well. That was intense. Um, I probably say that if you've never done anything, start with the slower stuff. Um, the, I, I, that's not what I did. I jumped all the way into the deep end with the 10 day silent retreat. Very interesting time. I'm so glad that I did it, but not easy. Yeah. Um, I loved before when we talked you, you looked at meditation, you said meditation is really just being, it's just you. It's, it's, it's kind of that, that being present. It's not absence of any thoughts whatsoever. You know, it's, it's not a specific visualization or whatever it might be that there are many different ways to do meditation and we shouldn't just be stuck on, okay, this is the one thing that meditation is. Um, Can you talk more about the different ways that you might help people quote unquote meditate, but that it, it can look very different among different people? Yeah, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to just assume that there's maybe a lot of beginning meditators out there, people who might be curious or turned off by the idea of it. First of all, we cannot turn off our thoughts like a faucet. So I like to invite uh, new meditators when I'm working with them is like, you know, imagine a beautiful stream and you're just watching this stream and there's sediment and there's leaves 
and there's those cute little water jumper things, you know, and you're just watching them float by. You wouldn't just like pluck them out. Like this shouldn't be in the stream. So those are your thoughts, but there's also this stream. There's this deeper awareness, which you actually tapped into earlier. You said like, whoa, it felt like the room was bigger. Mm -hmm. So we always have access to this deeper awareness. It's just sometimes we get in our own way with our thoughts, right? So there's all these different modalities and types of ways of bringing this awareness to be. Meditation, I've heard, is like, it's just, it, don't meditate. <laughs> you know? So for me personally, uh, I like guided meditation so that I, I have something to follow and listen to. Um, watching the breath, insight meditation, where you're, what you know, watching, observing the breath and body sensations. I also did Vipassana, a 10 day meditation. And yeah, that was hard. That is really, really hard and so amazing. And I got so much out of it. You can Google meditation and just read more about it. And I think what's important is for any person to just notice, okay, well, this sounds interesting to me, or I'm intrigued, curious, or listen to a bunch of guided meditations. And it's like, it's kind of like finding your favorite color. Like this feels really good when I wear it. I really like this. So you want to find something that feels good and is inviting and has you being curious about the experience. Uh, I suggest that with everything in life because then you're more likely to do it. <laughs> there is no one right way. And that's why there's so many ways because it's not a one size fits all, you know? But there's so many benefits to meditation. It's why it's like, find something that you can do for like at least 10 minutes a day. So you work with your mind and your focus, and then you get all those beautiful health benefits that come, up, come along with it, right? It's not to do it just to say you do it. I mean, it's not like all the cool kids are meditating. No, it's like science has backed it <laughs> for decades now. So it's proven to really help you. And I know for myself, like that's why I call it mental hygiene. If I don't meditate just one day, like I meditate every single day, but when I can't do it in the morning, cause like maybe there's an early flight or you know something happens with the schedule that doesn't allow for time. You know, I'm, I'm pretty rooted in my practice after many, many years of doing it, but there's still that kind of like layer of reactivity that is a little more accessible because I didn't have my morning meditation to really like sink in and just support my nervous system and my mind. And it's like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to not brush your teeth every day, right? Because you know what's going to happen. You're going to have bad breath, gingivitis. Dentist is going to look at you like you're crazy. Um, and it's, you're going to have like a bad taste in your mouth. Well, that's how I look at meditation. I am more reactive. I can't think as clearly. I'm not as flexible when I don't meditate every day. Those are just some of the things. <laughs> I might make less mindful choices. I might reach for the chocolate a little bit more there. <laughs> you know, like there's all these different um, kind of snowball effects of me not meditating every day. So that's why I'm like, yeah, I'm, I meditate every day because I know the benefits and I've experimented enough on myself to know why it works well for me personally. I, I really like the uh, the mental hygiene. I think that's that's it's a beautiful metaphor for it because then it also goes to the point of if you haven't been doing it and then you do it once or twice, you wouldn't expect your teeth to just be fantastic if you brush them once or twice after not brushing them for a year. No, there's there's definitely this. It has to just it has to build up, and yeah. also it's not as if you can just really intensely brush your teeth once and you're good for the rest of the year. There's also not that. I, Sure, you could go to a dentist. We're gonna keep going with this metaphor, but there, there is an amount to it. You go to a dentist, you could get the, the deep cleaning to get you really started so you can jump start it. In a way, that's what that 10 day meditation retreat was like because for mine, we were meditating 10 hours every single day, 
that really jump starts you a lot. So then you think, oh my goodness, 30 minutes or an hour of meditation per day is nothing compared to what I had to do. And so it's easier to, to sort of maintain that habit. I think it's, it's absolutely true um, along all those things. I also like the, the, co the color part because I have this beautiful purple background and my favorite color is purple, but it's this purple. And so a lot of times people will bring me things and they're like, this is the purple you like. I'm like, that's not the purple I like. This is some kind of lavender, some, don't give me this. I'm not interested. Put it away. Um, yeah. Because uh, the point of finding your favorite color, it's not just your basic five, six colors. So yeah. sort of with the meditation part of, yeah. okay, maybe you don't like the, the sitting in silence. Maybe you like breath work. Maybe you want to do movement meditation. I've done Tai Chi because I can't sit still. I love it because that's a meditative right. thing. Yeah. The, the thing that I always like to think of, I loved your final point of the idea of like, don't just meditate kind of kind of idea is it's always funny to me when somebody goes yeah meditation doesn't really work I'm like okay what well what works for you I just like to go fishing I throw my pole now and I just sit think about nothing I'm like guess what you're meditating that's, <laughs> you're, you're sitting there with a cup of coffee or whatever else it might be that's what you're doing we're just labeling it different things but most of us have that activity or that's something that we go oh I know that centers me and that might ground me a little bit more so mm -hmm. I really liked your point about the the kind of that label of meditation. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and maybe it's being with your dog. Maybe, you know, they're, they're <laughs> she's a with... puppy. She's eight months old, so she's just like the Energizer Bunny uh, times ten. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful. Well, uh, I want to go to a, a small little segment that I always enjoy, and that is talking about my guests' Instagrams. Um, now I always like to ask about the very first post that they ever made. I doubt that you remember the first post that you've ever made. It was we're coming up on 10 years ago, um, in August, it will be 10 years old. Um, and this was a post, uh, at the, uh, the red car river park, um, of this, this, this bridge and all of that, uh, in LA, uh, which now that I'm in LA, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I need to find out where in the world this is. This looks like a like a cool bit, but it seems that throughout all of it, you really, you like to explore, you like to travel. You don't seem like to be a person that just, I'm going to sit at home and just, just do things at home. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about, about that time of where you were kind of moving around, you were doing film stuff at that point as well. Um, and all of those things. Yeah. So you're asking about when I was in LA with that first post. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I, so I moved to LA from the San Francisco Bay area to pursue acting, which had been, uh, I'd been acting in the Bay area for many, many years. And I was around 30 something. And my uncle was kind of looking me in the face. He's like, this is going to be a hobby for your whole life. Are you going to go down to LA and do something about it? <laughs> I was like, mm, um, I don't know. So I went, and I was, you know, one of those cliche actors working at, you know, raw food restaurants and going to lots of auditions. And I, I felt like I was really happy to be there, actually. It felt like a new adventure. And um, I also was struggling because um, it's a lot of work to hustle out there. And I just wanted to make art and play in my art and collaborate with other people and make art. <laughs> so I met a lot of really great people and some of us are still friends. And I also, um, I started, you know, diving into spirituality and communication, personal development. <laughs> You're gonna hear squeaks, I keep trying to get rid of it, but. <laughs> so yeah, I was uh, studying Kabbalah at the Kabbalah Center. I was taking workshops at Landmark Education and I traveled to Thailand and, you know, I married my daughter's father and had my daughter there. It was just like a very interesting time of life. And, oh, I did a, I did the 10 day meditation right as I had become pregnant, which was crazy because <laughs> I'm at the 10 day silent meditation. I can't talk about it, but I'm like, you know how they have the special meals? Mm -hmm. And so I saw, 
I saw a big bowl of steamed broccoli as a special meal, stand, like kind of on the, sh the shelf where the food went. And I was looking at him like, I've never wanted steamed broccoli more in my life. I'm like, I must be pregnant. Like there's, there's some things going on with me physically and I can't talk about it with anybody. <laughs> and funny enough, the woman whose bunk was like head to head with mine, she was a doula. And I was just like, I need to talk to her. And I couldn't. And you know, all the other experiences of the, of the meditation retreat. So, um, this feels a little mishmashy in response, but it was just a very interesting growing experience that I was going through at that time and, and really enjoying life actually just at that time of life. <laughs> so question for you, given all, because it's very interesting. And I know a lot of people haven't had that 10 day silent meditation experience. Uh -huh. uh, you so you don't you don't speak the entire time you you do eat your food in kind of a general hall area you do usually meditate sometimes in isolation sometimes a hall is kind of a mixture of all of these different things um I, you get to talk to the instructor very briefly maybe if you have very specific questions other than that it's absolutely no talking it is kind of on the honor system but that's it and so when you get reintroduced to it my experience was even though I was surrounded as you you come to find out that very interesting people go to these things. So afterwards, you go, oh my goodness, everybody has a story uh, when you talk to them. We did ours, uh, I did mine in Texas. We, all the people that I didn't know, I was the only one I knew there, but there was a guy that hitchhiked from Washington state all the way down to Texas um, to do this. So crazy story amazing. you wouldn't have known, but yeah, the experience of when they finally kind of say, okay, you can all now talk. Uh, I remember walking into the dining hall and I actually didn't talk for the first hour of being let talk because it was just, everything was so loud. And I just, yeah. need, I just need to kind of get acclimated with this. Mm -hmm. You had so many, so many questions and so many things to discuss and all that. How was your experience of coming out of the silence and finally getting to talk just to some of these people? What was that like? Oh, I love that. Um, I kind of had an interesting experience where I was excited to talk, but it, everything was loud for me too, after all that silence. and. I noticed um, the judgmental mind coming back very strongly. And I was like, oh, uh, hmm, I don't really want that to happen. Noticing, oh, wow, like there's a conversation happening inside of my experience in this moment. I was generally just curious about the people I'd been seeing day in and day out for 10 days and like wanting to learn about them. But I eased in, I was there um, with my ex-husband and, um, you know, we were like, hi. And he was like, how was it for you? <laughs> you know and I'm like? Um, I have to tell you, I think I'm pregnant. <laughs> we're going to have to get a test on the way out here. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it was, and really interesting people were there. And some people were talking about going to, I think it was Thailand. There's these dark, cave like really long like month long and three month long meditations that you can go and do and I was like whoa like that just sounds unbelievable you know in the dark in a cave for that length of time just yeah so I was fascinated by just the stories of you know where people came from where they were going next the idea of all these other types of experiences that are out there that I didn't know about. Uh, but yeah, taking time. And, and it, I remember afterwards we went to the store after the completion of the retreat and we're in the supermarket and everything was just beautiful. I was like, I feel like I'm high on drugs. Everything is so beautiful in this store. People are so beautiful. And this is, yeah, I just came out of it with fresh eyes, open heart, open perspective and mind. And uh, yeah, it's like for you just jumping in with not knowing what the experience, I, I recommend, like, it's not for everyone. I've heard some stories where it wasn't really, a positive experience and some people have had to leave but if if it feels like somebody is curious about that I recommend it because you walk away with just fresh eyes 
I think that's very true. I think with how much we're overstimulated in our society, at least with, with everything. Yeah. That's absolutely true. I actually wanted to quit. There were three specific times that I wanted to quit and, quit and walk away. And the only reason I didn't is because some, the person that told me about this, this specific retreat said, you're going to want to quit. Don't yeah. quit. They're like, it's going to happen. Do mm-hmm. not do it. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, okay. And the, the time that I was, and I'm still unsure if I should have or should not have, maybe, maybe I should have walked out was, I think it was around day seven or eight, um, where my, what started happening is my eyes would refuse to stay shut. So I was getting about two hours of sleep because I just couldn't sleep. My eyes would just bolt open the mm-hmm. entire time. And I just, and I couldn't, and I was thinking, oh my goodness, what is happening? Why, why can't I, like, I'm just trying to sleep. I just, I just want to sleep a little bit. Uh, yeah. But I definitely would say, yeah, push, push through it. If it's, if it's mm-hmm. just mental, push through it. Cause that's where, that's where all that, that beauty and everything lies. Something I wanted to ask you about also based off of your uh, most more recent post, not your first post ever on Instagram, but more recent is you had a post that uh, was basically talking about how would it be different if, if we could love ourselves more radically? And mm. I really, I was very interested about this idea of radically loving ourselves. Um, what, what did you mean when, when you were, when you put up radically loving ourselves? Cause I think that's very interesting. And some people might just go, oh, you just mean love ourselves. But I, I think in, including the word radically is, it gives it a lot more power than just, just that phrase. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. And I appreciate that last comment for folks to just stick with it and push through. I have so many stories about me wanting to leave too, but I'll keep going. Um, So I read Radical Acceptance by my teacher, Tara Brock. And I like made notes and dog-eared throughout the whole book. And I was very, very interested in the idea of radically accepting myself and um just started to build in a practice of that because we can be our worst critics right we really like can find so many things to pick on ourselves about and um i also have been a participant um in many workshops with the human awareness institute which is high.org and they do Uh, workshops around love, intimacy, and sexuality. And so through my work with them, just kind of learning to really love and accept myself as well as others. And so I'd been in this exploration for a while, you know, several years of just really finding ways to accept and love myself more and more. And I've had some transformational experiences through the process of You know, as a woman, (laughs) we have a lot of external noise about how we should look and what we should buy and how all the things that um, can really drive us insane. All right. There's like multi-billion industries out there telling us what's wrong with us so that we buy their products. So... Um, I took a course in women's studies a few years ago, and it brought even more awareness to this. And so I, I started getting just really, really curious about the inner dialogue of what I was saying to myself when I wasn't being kind and loving. And it's interesting. Some of those voices aren't even mine. Maybe a parent or a teacher or an ex-lover or, you know, just different things and um no honey and uh the more aware I became of it and wanted to change the inner dialogue of what I was saying to myself the more it became like like an an interested mission like wait a minute what would my life be like if I wasn't criticizing and judging myself and so it's just like a process that began to unfold and um so about like the year 2000, I started going to Burning Man and I got a pin as a gift and it says love deputy. And I have it in my room and hold on, Suki, no, come here, Suki. That's not for you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so I, w- I wore this pin proudly, like, yeah, 
I want to be the love deputy. Like that feels right. I've been a hugger most of my life. I meet people. I, you know, I want to hug. It was so hard during COVID not hugging people. And, um, so then after reading radical acceptance of Tara Brock, I'm like, well, what if I radically loved myself? What if I fiercely, I had fierce compassion for myself. And what would that be like? What, how would I experience me? And so it's like, it's like a process that I put myself through. It's an idea. It's not something that is like you're fixed. And then all of a sudden you're just radically loving yourself and everybody else. Right. It's like, but if it's like the intention, right? Well, if I have this intention of radically loving myself, what does that look like? What does that feel like? How does that sound in my inner dialogue? How do I show up in life? How do I model for my younger daughter who's impressionable and watching everything I do and say and all the subconscious stuff that's being fed to her as well? Like, what is possible for my experience in this lifetime if I take on this idea of radically loving myself? And so it's an, it's a, an experiment, an exploration. It's a choose your own adventure. <laughs> I love choose your own adventures. Um, those, yeah. I think those are fantastic. I think the point also here, and this is something that I try to drive with the vast majority of my conversations is taking the action, because I think so many of us might hear this, like the thought of love yourself, radically love yourself, uh, you know, unstoppably love yourself, whatever it might be. They're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah do it start it's not going to be perfect you're not going to get fixed right away exactly like you said but you have to start it start writing down what your vision of loving yourself is going to be like maybe yeah. it's and this is where i think that we just need to be accepting of some of those truths some of those things that that you can't maybe change about yourself it's because some people go no, no no if i keep on dieting and exercising that will give me the, the shape and the body that i will love maybe but also there could be a hormonal issue, but why should that mean you can never love your body ever again? Right. And you're not gonna immediately start loving your body for the way that it is. You're gonna have oh. to grow with it. This is something that I struggle with all the time. I hate the way that I look and I'm constantly mm -hmm. working out too hard and not eating enough over and over mm -hmm. and over. And my wife is like, why? You look great. And I'm going, no, it's not, it's not good enough. But then it's slowly working in that, okay, no, it should be good enough for me. Yeah. In, in, in that kind of a way. So. I yeah. encourage people to start the work. Start the work, please. Yeah, and I really appreciate like you mentioning that, you know, some core wounding that many of us have is not good enough. And when we're searching outside of ourselves or trying to fix or improve ourselves with this idea that we're not good enough, it's it's a it's a hamster wheel that you just can't get off of or a treadmill, really, you know? So my invitation is like, well, just take a foot off the treadmill, hold onto the bars for a minute and just be curious. Like, can it be good enough? Mm -hmm. In the sense of like, just start liking yourself and see what that's like. Just put a toe in the water and experiment and play with that. And as the process unfolds, it's, it's a, it's a daily practice, like, <laughs> it, and it's a lifelong commitment to oneself to just really have reverence for the being that we are. I mean, we come into this life as babies, just reveling in love. We are just pure love as babies. And then we have these life experiences that like I was sharing with you earlier, it's like we we have these strategies to stay safe, right? And so somebody says something or does something or tells you something as a child and you make this decision, oh, I'm not good enough. Or I have to people please or gain that approval to be enough. And it's like, well, well what would happen if we just reparent ourselves and give ourselves the love and the kindness and that just sweet compassion that we wish we had had as children. And we just keep doing that and invite that in our, in our close circles, you know, and connections, because why not? What would that be like? 
what would life be like if we showed up being the love we want to see in the world? Very, very true. Unfortunately, I feel that so many people, it, we've had decades of this stuff programmed subconsciously, consciously. You know, yes. And, and it's, it can, I understand why it can be so hard to, to start. Yeah. So undoubtedly, I'm sure that people go, I, I'm connected to this. I need to, I need to find out how to work more with you. How can people connect with you, work with you, learn more about all the wonderful things that you do? Thanks. Yeah, that's so sweet. Um, so uh, you're welcome to share links. Um, if people are curious about working with me and I've shared some things that resonate, um, I'd be honored to explore what working together might look like. And I have a Be Seen and Heard Breakthrough session, which is 60 minutes long. It's valued at 197. And I can offer it to your listeners for complimentary for free. And we can have a connected conversation and explore that. Beautiful. Where can people find you if they just want to just, just reach out, learn more about you in general? My website, leahdiamond.com. Perfect. All those links we'll, we'll have down below. And Sweet. I commend you. I, I was not even remotely surprised that this is the way that you worded it. But I want people to understand that the way that you worded it and said everything was that we're going to see, basically, if you can help them. Not, I'm going to take your money no matter what you do. No. Can I help? If I can't help, I'm not mm. going to try to necessarily take your money. And guys, that is so important to find with whoever you might be looking for. If you're looking for the help, it's not about the money. You have to be looking for the connection. It's just it's so bad. And I, I knew, I didn't even question the fact that you know how important that is and that that's exactly what you practice. And I love that that's what you practice. Thank you so much. My last question that I always like to just see if there's anything lingering, any final thoughts, um, anything that you just want to kind of leave people off with. Mm. You know, one of my mentors says connection matters more than anything. And I truly believe that, you know, with others, you know, being in connection, but also with ourselves. And, you know, maybe there are some listeners who some of these ideas are like outlandish or not in their scope or whatever, not their cup of tea. And I honor that. And I hope if there's anything that I may have shared that uh, strips a little curiosity like follow that thread you know why not um who knows where it will lead so uh yeah connection curiosity and as best as you're able um stay in your heart beautifully said Thank you so much for being on the show. This was this was a wonderful episode. I think this is the most that we've had a pup interact in the middle of one of our episodes. So I, I love how many firsts we're doing this time. So thank you so much for being here. It's been my honor. Thank you for being such a great host. This has been super fun from the moment we met. So I really appreciate you. I really appreciate all that you're all the good you're putting out into the world. So thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor and a pleasure. My biggest takeaway from all of this is that idea that meditation is just being, is that even going to the grocery store, you could still be meditating as you're walking there. It's almost a mindset around meditation, not just an action you have to take and sit down in a lotus position or something like that. We don't have to beat ourselves up for not doing that specific meditation. It can be very different for all of us. It's the result we're after, not the actual necessary practice. And that can be very unique. And that is so wonderful to hear, but again, we still have to do it. It doesn't mean we get to do the same exact things that are not bringing us that result. Guys, the best way that you can support me having these discussions with people going deep and really trying to open up some of these cliches, because they are cliches for a reason, but they don't seem to help us, is by reviewing, rating, sharing the podcast. That is the best way, truly. It's on YouTube, it's on Apple Podcasts. Apple Podcasts loves their reviews. So help me out. That is the best way. All of this info is, as I said, in the show notes. Um, and as always, until next time.